We're right in the middle of election season. And the worst of it hasn't even started yet. In a few weeks, we won't be able to escape the political ads telling us how terrible one candidate or party is. And it all just gets muddled up into fact-twisting and name-calling and mudslinging until nobody comes out of it clean. Politics is messy. And that's, I think, why Jesus came the way he did. He didn't come to establish or operate within an earthly kingdom because Jesus came to do something that no earthly kingdom can do. In fact, Jesus' mission put earthly powers on trial, and that ultimately led to his trial and crucifixion. After his arrest, when he's being interrogated by Pontius Pilate in John 18, 36, it says, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest but the, by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And because his kingdom was not of this world, Jesus did some pretty incredible things to demonstrate the difference between his kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. And the things that Jesus did to advertise his kingdom, so to speak, were much more about displaying the truth and glorifying God than about pointing out how bad the other side was. Yes, Jesus did confront the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Yes, he overturned the tables of the money changers and drove them out of the temple and things like that. But the miracles that Jesus performed were to demonstrate the values of his kingdom. So today, let's look at a few of the miracles that Jesus performed and see what they tell us about the kingdom of heaven that he has invited us into. The first thing that we see is that the kingdom is about spiritual healing, not just physical. We're amazed when we hear the stories of Jesus healing people with illnesses or physical deformities, but to Jesus, there was something more substantial and important than just the physical struggles that people had. But often it was the physical needs that opened the door for Jesus to teach about the spiritual healing that was even more important. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we read a story about a man in need who had some faithful friends. This man was paralyzed, wasn't able to do anything for himself, but he and his friends believe that Jesus can help. And so his friends carry this man on his mat to a house where Jesus is and he's, he's teaching. But when they get there, the crowd is too big for them to even get close to Jesus. But they aren't, they're determined. So they go up on the roof, they pull up some tiles and they lower their friend down right in front of Jesus on his mat. Then this is what it says in Luke 5, 20 through 26. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. I remember my Sunday school teacher when I was a kid, Mrs. Floyd, teaching about this story with the little flannel graph paper cutouts of the characters. And the thing that I always remembered about the story was that this guy's friends made a hole in the roof and they lowered him down through it. And Jesus seemed impressed by that too. He, he took that as a sign of their faith. But his immediate response to that faith of this man and his friends was not to physically heal the man. Jesus' main concern was, that the man's, was for the man's spiritual health. The need in this man that Jesus recognized was not his need to walk, but his need to have his sins forgiven. And the reason that Jesus went on to physically heal the man was to show his authority to forgive sins. And the kingdom of heaven has not changed. The most important healing that takes place when we're part of the kingdom is the spiritual healing and forgiveness of sin that comes through Jesus. Because that's a healing that lasts beyond the grave and through eternity. Physical healing is temporary, but forgiveness lasts forever. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And that life to come is the life that we live now if we're living in the kingdom of heaven. 
And when we look at the thing that motivated Jesus to declare that forgiveness to the paralyzed man, we see another theme about the kingdom of heaven. And that is that the kingdom is about faith. And when we look at this point in relation to the miracles of Jesus, we see that it operates in two ways. The miracles of Jesus inspire faith, and they also require faith. So let's look at something Jesus did in Luke chapter 7. In verses 11 through 17, it says, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer, and they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So in this miracle, we see that this woman didn't ask Jesus for anything. Doesn't even say that she knew he was there or, or who he was. It was Jesus who was moved to take action this time. This passage says that his heart went out to her. Some other translations will say that he had compassion on her. But there's really not an English translation that does the original language justice. This is one of the best Greek words that's used here. And it's the word splagnitznomi. And, and even the way it sounds helps to convey the meaning. What splagnitznomi means is to be moved in your bowels. The closest English phrase we have might be gut-wrenching. When Jesus saw this widow mourning over the death of her only son, he felt the gut-wrenching grief of that situation. And he was so moved that he raised her son from the dead and gave him back to his mother. Jesus didn't ask this woman first if she had faith, but the miracle inspired faith in the people that saw it. They recognized the power and authority of Jesus and even proclaimed that God had come to help his people. And then they went and spread the word and told everyone in the surrounding area what had happened. So the miracle inspired faith. And when we look at the story of another struggling woman, we see the other way that the kingdom is about faith. In Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34, it says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So in this instance, Jesus is moved in a different way. Instead of feeling compassion, he feels power go out from him unexpectedly. He didn't seek this woman out or even talk to her before she was healed. And it wasn't just because she touched him that she was healed. When he asked, Who touched me? His disciples are like, Um... Look around, Jesus. We're pushing through a crowd. There are people all around you touching you. But power didn't go out from Jesus to all those other people who were touching him. So it wasn't simply touching him that healed her. Jesus tells her it was her faith. She believed. She placed her faith and hope in him, and she was healed. So in these two miracles performed for women in need, we see that these miracles inspired and required faith. And being part of the kingdom of heaven requires faith. Remember, we read a couple of weeks ago that Jesus gives the right to be called children of God to all who would believe in his name. Believing in Jesus as the Son of God and putting our faith in him allows us to live in the kingdom. And as we live in the kingdom, doing the things he called us to do and living for him, our faith and the things that Jesus does in us and through us can inspire faith in other people as well. 
So the kingdom is still very much about faith. And when we look at the miracles of Jesus, another theme that we see is that the kingdom is about restoration. If you remember, as we went through the Old Testament, we saw how the design of how God wanted his people to live had a lot to do with restoration. The the way that God wanted the Israelites to structure their society and their lives was all about caring for others and welcoming the stranger, supporting the widow and the orphans and building others up and forgiving each other. But by the time Jesus came, there was a lot of division and fractures in the culture. A large number of people who were sick and poor and tormented lived as outcasts from their families and communities. In Mark chapter 5, we read about one of those people who was an extreme case. It says that this man was possessed by demons, that he lived among the tombs, and he was out of his mind. The people who lived near there had tried to bind him with chains, but he had broken those. It says that day and night the man cried out and cut himself with stones. Everybody lived in fear of this man. But when Jesus showed up, the man came running to him. And when Jesus asked him his name, he answered legion because there were so many demons possessing him. The demons begged Jesus not to drive them away, but to cast them into a herd of pigs grazing nearby. And when Jesus did, the pigs ran down the hill into the sea and drowned themselves. And then here's what it says in Mark 5, 14 through 20. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So Jesus didn't just heal this man, he restored him to his community. He told him to go back to his own people, the same ones who had rejected him, driven him away, and run in fear from him. Jesus told this man to go back and to show them the difference that the mercy of God had made in his life. This man who had once been a sign of evil and fear had the chance to be a sign and the voice of hope to his people. And we see another example of restoration in the story of Zacchaeus. And this isn't an outright miracle, but we can, I think, consider it a miracle of sorts. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which we've talked about before. It would have been made it so that his people viewed him as a traitor against them working for Rome. And when Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to town, he climbed up in a tree so that he could see Jesus better. And Jesus called him down from that tree, and he told Zacchaeus that he was coming to his house. But again, people start to mutter because, well, here's Jesus again hanging out with sinners. Then in Luke 19, 8 through 10, it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I'll bet you this is one of those splagnitz nome gut-wrenching moments for Zacchaeus because I can almost guarantee that he had not been called a son of Abraham for a long, long time. He would have had people telling him that he had no place with his people or his community. But Jesus proclaims his acceptance as a full member of the people of God. And it was because Zacchaeus had been changed, because of his encounter with Jesus and the acceptance that Jesus gave him, he had realized that there was more than just gaining riches for himself in life. He had realized that life was different when you're part of the kingdom of heaven. And that's another theme that we see when we look at the miracles of Jesus, and that is that the kingdom of God is about true life. In the Gospel of John, we read about a family, a brother and two sisters that Jesus is very close to. They've been followers and supporters of Jesus and his ministry, and Then word comes to Jesus that his friend, Lazarus, is very sick. But even though the news is urgent, Jesus waits two more days before leaving for Bethany, where Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, lived. 
When he got there, he's told that Lazarus has been dead for four days. The sisters of Lazarus are mourning the loss of their brother, and Jesus comforts them. Then in John 11, 38 through 44, it says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. It says there at the beginning of this passage that Jesus was again deeply moved. And we might think, ah, splagnitz nome again. But actually, this is a Greek word, embraamehi, which literally means to snort with displeasure. So it seems that Jesus is not moved with emotion here, but almost with frustration. And I think it might be because in their grief, these people are missing the point. Actually, Martha seems to be the only one who has the right perspective. Here's the conversation that they had just before Jesus raised Lazarus. In John 11, 21 through 27, it says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Martha knows that Lazarus has a life that is deeper and more enduring than the earthly life that he had lost to his illness. She knew that what Jesus said was true, that he is the resurrection and the life. That he did not just have life or give life, but that he is life because there's one thing that is true of every person that Jesus physically healed and even the people he brought back to life. It was all temporary. Lazarus and that young man that Jesus raised and gave back to his mother, they both died again. That paralyzed man that Jesus made walk, his, his body and his strength diminished as he got older and he died someday. But the greatest healing that Jesus offered, the spiritual healing that came with the forgiveness of sins, that healing and that life lasts forever because that life is found in him, in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. So Jesus is the Lord of miracles, and he's still doing miracles today. Yes, sometimes physical, incredible miracles, making the lame walk and the blind see, but more importantly, he's still offering us the mir miraculous healing and new life that comes as being part of the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom is about faith, it's about restoration, it's about true everlasting life. If we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, if we've been baptized into a relationship with him, we are walking, talking, living miracles. Miracles that have new life in the kingdom of God because of Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Father, we sometimes get our perspective off on miracles and we we're amazed by physical miracles and, and healings and things that, that we see in, in our worldly perspective, but we, we can sometimes lose sight of the importance of the miraculous spiritual healing that comes through the forgiveness of sins with Jesus as our Savior. And we sometimes lose sight of the fact that that new life that we have in Him is an eternal life, not just that we look forward to someday when we die, but a life that lived now in, in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus brought to this earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and in our lives as it is in heaven. So we ask that you'd help us to live understanding that we have miraculous healing, miraculous healing of our sins, 
a miraculous healing of the relationship between you and us because of what Jesus has done. And we pray that, that you would help our faith to drive us to live more fully for you each day and that, that as we do that, it would inspire faith in the people around us. We love you and we thank you for including us in your kingdom and giving us new life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.